And when you say to me, why do I have to worry this way? My other friends don't do this. This is so scary. You can say to her, that breaks my heart. It's so sad to watch you go through this and it's so frustrating. So let's practice. We're going to retrain the amygdala. And the way we retrain the amygdala is to give the amygdala a different message by not acting as if what the worry is saying is true. Welcome to season six of Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about a family's anxiety and all the big feelings too. We tackle the serious stuff without being too serious. And I'm your co-host, Robin. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author. And I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. I'll give you concrete steps to take and the words to say. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We are doing another Fluster Clucks in session episode where I am actually talking to a real person about a real problem and you get to hear how we can work through this together. I am happy to introduce Marie. Marie, thanks for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about your family and what you would like help with? Hi, Lynn. I have a nine-year-old daughter who has a lot of worries She's never been a great sleeper, so she has a lot of worries around going to sleep, around being on her own at night, and so that's always been a problem. She goes through phases of sleeping well for a few months, and then another worry will crop up. At the moment, she has an extreme worry of going upstairs on her own. She believes that somebody's upstairs hiding in our house. So that stops her going upstairs to the toilet, to the bathroom on her own, to go to bed on her own, to get something out of her room. And when you say currently, is that she used to be able to go upstairs and now she can't? Yeah, she's never had a problem before. So I'm not quite sure what triggered that. Possibly something she saw on TV or heard at school, but... Yeah. Or made up. I've never met a worrier that doesn't have a great imagination. She has an amazing imagination. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Which is fantastic. I love that about her. And uh, Okay. And are there any other siblings in the family? She has an older brother who's 11. So she's nine and older brother's 11 and no anxiety at all for him. Yep. And then I think I saw, was that your husband that was just peeking in as we were starting? Yes. Okay. And can you tell me anything that you've done or anything that's helped as you're helping her? So this is a problem I have. I'm very inconsistent with the way I deal with her anxiety, depending on my energy levels and my mood. And yeah, so that's what I sort of need help with. Uh, Something I can say or do for her that's the same every time. Mm -hmm. And you're exactly right about that because consistency is the name of the game, Mm. which I'm sure you've experienced, right? So if you can stick with something, but it's hard to be consistent. This is an exhausting thing. And the thing that I often say when we're talking about sleep problems is the reason that it's so hard to deal with sleep problems is because it's at the end of the day and you're exhausted. Although people will also say, well, we have a terrible time with the morning routine. And I'll say, I know it's hard because it's the beginning of the day, (laughs) (laughs) the middle of the day. And so how does she do going to school or being away from you or that kind of stuff? She's great now. We have had problems in the past. When she was a bit younger, she would have a bit of separation anxiety with school. But we're past that now. Okay. You are obviously speaking to me from another continent. How have things been in terms of COVID and life back to normal and all that kind of stuff? What's the status of her being able to sort of be out in the world these days? We are in New Zealand, so we have had a couple of lockdowns. But where I am, they've, our longest lockdown has been about seven weeks of homeschooling. So pretty good, really. And then apart from that, because we locked our borders, we have been free to travel around our own country. So I sort of, we've been lucky. And I feel like our children haven't really been affected too much by it. We've all had COVID and survived. And I don't feel like she has a lot of anxiety around COVID. About 10 years ago, we had a very big major earthquake in our city. Oh, right. And I think that has affected her as well. Okay. So the issue primarily is around bedtime. She can get up in the morning. She goes off to school. Will she go and often play with friends and all that kind of stuff? Yes. 
So if I was hanging around with her during the course of her day, I wouldn't really notice this thing showing up until nighttime? Correct. Okay. And what about during the day? Like if you were on a weekend or something, if you were to send her up to her room, would she go upstairs by herself? Or is it anytime she's in the house? It's more towards the evening. I have caught her just running upstairs. I think she'll forget that she has this worry. So yeah, it is more towards the evening when it gets dark. When it gets dark. Okay. And if she's able to articulate that I'm worried, I'm imagining that there's someone upstairs. Yes. And is she pretty committed that there really is somebody upstairs or does she say, I know that my worry scares me or I know I'm imagining it? No, she's determined. She believes that there is someone upstairs and it's so illogical because even if I myself or my husband will be upstairs with her, then she won't want to go into the bathroom on her own, which is also upstairs. Our house is very small. So yeah. Okay. And how much does she understand about worry and how it works? We've been through that a lot. I've brought a lot of books about worry and read them with her and talked about worry. She calls it her worry has her name. She's called Warty as in worry wart. So she also calls it her worry bug because another thing that she is affected by is she has this fear or anxiety around vomiting. So when she is worrying she feels sick and then she worries that she's going to be sick so quite that's also at night time quite often she'll lie in bed and get upset that she has this fear that she's going to vomit in the night Mm -hmm. okay so here's a good example and for all of you listening to the podcast where it really is not about the content so if i were talking to you if i were not me (laughs) If I were somebody else, I might say, oh, so what do you think happened that made her scared of the bathroom? Or what was the situation, right? And people want to find out the why they want to get to, well, did she ever have an experience where she was terrorized by this or that? And usually the answer is no, right? I mean, she had this earthquake that she went through, but this has been going on for a while. And it's very common for kids to worry about throwing up. It's very common for kids to worry about somebody hiding in the closet or some scary thing. So we want to focus on with her about how her worry works, how her imagination works, and how she gets herself worried. So if we were to ask her and to ask you, how does she do it? You know, you've heard me say doing the disorder. How does she do her worry? What does she do? What are the thoughts she has? What are the actions she takes? Are there any safety behaviors or accommodations that are in place? How does the worry sort of run her and run the house? Again, depending on how we're all feeling, our response to her is quite different from day to day. So we do accommodate her because if we need her to be doing something upstairs, we'll we'll go with her. So in that way, we're accommodating her and feeding her worry, I suppose. If we have more time or if, or less patience, I don't go up with her. And then that causes, she still won't go up on her own. And, and then that causes angst and frustration on both sides. Yeah. And is there a difference between the way you and your husband deal with it? Do you guys have different approaches or it is the similar sort of like, oh, sometimes we help, sometimes we don't. This is exhausting. How do you guys deal with it differently? I think we're pretty similar. Yeah. I probably accommodate more than he does. Okay. And so if she were to go upstairs, if say she wanted something upstairs and you said, we've got this new way of doing this, I'm not going to work for worry wart. I'm not going to be in charge of this. I'm not going to do this. What would she ultimately do? What would she say? If you were to say, I'm not playing the game, what would she say? She would get upset. And I've tried to do an exercise where I'll come with you to the landing, you know, halfway up the stairs and then she'll go that far and then she will just sit down and cry, get cross. Okay. If I were talking to her, would she be able to explain the rationale of why we don't listen to worry? She does know that. We have spoken to her about that. My response is that's your worry tricking you. And if I come upstairs with you, I'm proving to you that you do need to be worried. So I'm not going to come upstairs with you. And she can repeat, she knows that, but I think in her state of worry, she can't get to that place on her own. Mm -hmm. Exercise is one of the main 
things that helps people with anxiety and depression. We've talked about this a lot, actually. And you're an exerciser. I'm one of those people who has to overcome resistance to exercise. So there are things, though, that really make it better. And that's why I love Copilot. The thing about Copilot is that it gives you real person accountability. It makes expert training affordable. I love that I get to connect with a real life trainer. It's fantastic even when I'm traveling because just in my hotel room, my trainer knows how to customize a workout for what I bring to the table and it keeps me consistent and holds me accountable. It's so cost-effective compared to traditional in-person training. That's what Copilot offers people who are busy, who are on the go, but who really need somebody to walk them through and to keep track for them. I'd love for you all to follow our lead and get fit and feel fabulous and give Copilot a try and find out why it was listed by Forbes as the top-rated personal trainer app of 2023. Head to go.mycopilot dot com slash flusterclucks to get a 14 day free trial with your own personal trainer. That's go.mycopilot.com slash flusterclucks to get a free 14 day trial with your very own personal trainer and take a back seat and let Copilot help you reach your fitness goals. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. With chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track for your healthy lifestyle. So if you're too busy to cook this fall, but you want to make sure you're eating well, with Factor, skip the extra trip at the grocery store and the chopping and prepping and cleaning up too. You'll still get the flavor and the nutrients you need with Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals and they're ready in just two minutes. All you have to do is heat them up and enjoy. And I got to tell you, I got sick this past month. I had a fridge full of Factor meals and it fed everybody and it was the greatest gift. Relish the best of autumn with fall flavors with limited time only hearty, comforting meals featuring seasonal veggies like cranberry pecan chicken and apple Dijon pork chops. Again, they're ready in just two minutes. So this October, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Head to factormeals.com slash fluster50 and use code fluster50 to get 50% off. That's code fluster50 at factormeals.com slash fluster50 to get 50% off. Okay, we're back. Okay, when you're on your game... When you're doing what you need to, you're saying all the right things. You're doing all the right things. But as you said, it's a matter of consistency. And that's the reality of dealing with this thing. So what I would do, I would let her know that you and I talked. I would have her watch some videos of me or the kids video that's on my website, whatever videos you want. So she knows who it was that you were talking to. And this is what I would say to her. Your worry bosses you around. Your worry is really good at grabbing onto your imagination. Your worry is really good at making things into an emergency that aren't an emergency. And this is what worry does. When people are worrying about something, it's not that there's really an emergency. It's not that there's really something that they need to handle. If my son falls off his bike and gets hurt, this actually happened, he broke his arm and comes running into the house and he's upset, I don't say, oh, we're worrying about this. We say, we've got an emergency to deal with. But your worry is not an emergency. It just makes you think it's an emergency and it makes your body and your brain act as if there's an emergency. And I would explain to her that her worry, which lives up here in her prefrontal cortex, her worry is really good at creating this movie creating this narrative. So she's probably imagining she's going to go into the bathroom and there's going to be somebody in the shower that's going to reach out and grab her. She can probably feel it in her body. She could imagine it. Do you remember the movie, The Sixth Sense that came out years and years ago? Did did you see that movie? Yeah, I did. Okay. So it scared the crap out of me because I'm a scaredy cat. And that scene where the dead girl reaches out from under the bed and grabs the boy's ankle, I can still feel that, right? I can feel it. So that's what she's doing. She's feeling it. She's experiencing it. So her poor little worry is creating this scenario, creating this movie. It's sending that message to her amygdala. And her amygdala is doing what her amygdala is supposed to do. It's acting as if it's really happening. 
She really does seem terrified, you know. Yeah. Well, because she has her worry is showing her this movie that she is getting fully absorbed in. And you're exactly right when you say to her, this is your brain tricking you. This is your worry tricking you. And the problem is, is that you keep watching the movie over and over and over again. And your poor amygdala is responding as if it's real because that's all the amygdala knows how to do. So the more that you tell the amygdala that there's somebody in the bathroom, the more the amygdala acts as if there's somebody in the bathroom. The more you tell the amygdala that you're about to throw up, the more that the amygdala freaks out that you're about to throw up. The more that you tell the amygdala that throwing up is the most awful, horrible thing, the more the amygdala believes you because the amygdala has to believe you. What we need to do is we need to give the amygdala some different information. Her prefrontal cortex is the smoke maker. The amygdala is the smoke detector. And the smoke detector doesn't say, oh, that's just a story. The amygdala doesn't say, oh, here we go again. The amygdala listens to the message. And the message that she's giving over and over and over again is there's an emergency. So you want to say to her, you are acting as if there's an emergency. And I get it. And you can say, you're not doing this on purpose. You're not doing this to be dramatic, but you've trained your brain. You've trained your imagination. You've trained your amygdala to act as if there's an emergency. And I'm not going to act as if what your worry is saying is true. You and your worry have to change your relationship. Because right now your worry hijacks your imagination and is telling you that there is danger and you're believing it. And she knows as well. She has said to me, I wish I didn't worry like this. Why do I worry like this? And my friends don't worry. Yeah. So that's good because she is saying like, gosh, why do I worry like this? Why do I do this? Here's the answer. When she asks that question, why do I worry like this? What you want to say to her is, well, we don't really need to answer this why question, but we need to answer the how question. Why do you worry like this? Well, there's a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is because you have a really good imagination and you've really created in your brain, you and your worry have created this really quick pathway. So it's sort of like if you lived on a farm and there was a barn and there was a farmhouse and the farmer walked back and forth to the barn every day and created this nice, well-worn pathway, you've created a really nice, well-worn pathway in your brain. Worry is normal. We all have thoughts about that. Sometimes when I'm walking to my bed, I can feel that hand coming out and grabbing me by the ankle. We all have those worries. But what she's doing is believing them. She's believing them. So we want to say to her, your worry is really clever and your worry is just like everybody else's worry. People worry about things that scare them. They don't worry about like, oh, I'm worried there's going to be a beautiful bird. They worry about things that scare them and then you dive right into it. As if you've got this big movie theater in your brain and you're just watching the movie and then your poor little amygdala has no choice but to respond. We're going to work on allowing the worry to show up. We're going to work on allowing the worry to show up. We know it's going to show up. Every night it's going to show up. You can say to her, as crazy as this sounds, we're going to do things on purpose to make the worry show up because that's going to give you practice handling the worry in a different way. Now, that's easy to do in your house because it shows up every night. It's not like she's worried about tarantulas. You can say to her, we're going to practice, we're going to make this a game. And what the game is going to be, and again, tell her, I know this sounds crazy, but we've got to retrain the amygdala and we've got to make your worry less powerful. Doesn't mean the worry isn't going to show up. Doesn't mean the worry is not going to really try and convince you. We're going to make the worry show up and we're going to have a different response to it. So right here, right now, let's think about how we want to respond to the worry and have her come up and you come up with some very simple phrases, some mantras, so that when she goes upstairs, worry is going to show up. She's going to have a response. You're going to have a response. She's going to come back downstairs. She's going to do that repeatedly. And I would practice this when it's not dark outside. So I would practice it when the stakes are a little lower. Make it a game. For example, you say, okay, I'm going to go upstairs and I'm going to put an apple on the bathroom sink. 
And your job is to go up and get the apple and bring it back down. And the slower you do it, the better. Because she's going to want to sprint up, grab the apple, sprint back (laughs) down, right? And if she's sprinting and grabbing the apple and sprinting back down, then she is acting as if it's dangerous up there. And you're going to practice and your worry is going to show up. What is she going to say to the worry? She's going to say, worry, I know you're going to show up, right? Number one, we're going to expect it. We're going to expect it to show up. We want it to show up. That's what sounds so crazy. And then we're going to give the amygdala an opportunity to learn something new. Because right now, your smoke detector thinks there's always a fire upstairs. Even when there's not a fire, you're saying, fire, fire, fire. And see if you can get her to play this game. It's a game of repetition. It's a game of consistency. If you have to bribe her a little bit to do this, to make it fun, that's okay. We want her to be engaged in it. We want her to see it as a game. We want her to see it as something that she's going to practice and learn over time. And we want to take the emotional intensity out of it. People will say to me, oh, you shouldn't bribe kids to do things. Yeah, no, no, I get it. I get it. I know we're not supposed to bribe kids to do things. Don't give her a pony. But make it a little silly and make it a little fun. So maybe there's a little candy that she likes. You know, maybe there's a little something she's going to earn points or something. But you want it to be a game. And the reason you're doing this with her, you want to say to her, is because I can see how powerful your worry is. And when you say to me, why do I have to worry this way? My other friends don't do this. This is so scary. You can say to her, that breaks my heart. It's so sad to watch you go through this and it's so frustrating. So let's practice. We're going to retrain the amygdala. And the way we retrain the amygdala is to give the amygdala a different message by not acting as if what the worry is saying is true. Do you think seeing a therapist or psychiatrist would be helpful, but you don't really have time to actually find one and meet with them? Try Talkspace by doing everything online. Talkspace has made getting the help you want easy, accessible, and affordable. It's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions with your licensed therapist from the comfort of your own home. Talkspace is secure and private, using the latest end-to-end bank-grade encryption technology to store client information and comply with the latest HIPAA regulations. And Talkspace is affordable because it's in-network with most major insurers. So as a listener of this podcast, you'll get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster to get $80 off your first month as a listener of this show. That's Talkspace.com slash Fluster. It's the season when kids head back to school and life moves indoors. So this inevitably brings more germs and opportunities to start feeling under the weather. But stay ahead of the game with Beekeepers Naturals Propolis Throat Spray and their new kids Propolis Throat Soothing Lollipops. Propolis Throat Spray is available in adults and kids versions, and it's a great daily proactive immune support that tastes good and it soothes your throat. And those kids' throat-soothing lollipops are the most delicious dose of defense. They're providing propolis, vitamin D, zinc, and wildflower honey to soothe kids' throats and support their immune systems. So include those lollipops as one of your back-to-school lunchbox sweet treats. But these have 50% less sugar, so your kids won't crash after lunch. Sometimes, as you know, it can be a battle to get kids to take medicines and supplements, but they actually love the taste of Beekeepers Naturals products. So today, Beekeepers Naturals is offering you an exclusive offer. Go to beekeepersnaturals.com slash flusterclucks and enter code flusterclucks to get 20% off your order. That's B-E-E-K-E-E-P-E-R-S-N-A-T-U-R-A-L-S dot com slash flusterclucks or enter the code flusterclucks. Beekeepers Naturals products are also available at Target, Whole Foods, Amazon, CVS, and Walgreens. Okay, so now back to the show. So the other thing that you can do with kids like this, what's something that she doesn't worry about at all that maybe is a common thing that other kids worry about? She doesn't worry about, she's not scared of dogs or swimming or she's not scared of a lot of things. It's the 
contradiction with her she'll we go skiing and snowboarding a lot and she'll go off on her own on the chairlift up to the top of the mountain and ski down on her own so yeah well because this thing makes no sense she can go off and do things and be on her own when she's on a ski mountain but she won't go upstairs to her own bathroom she truly believes there is someone up there even when i questioned do you really think there would be someone hiding in our house she truly believes there is someone hiding Okay. Well, she's telling you she truly believes it, right? She doesn't truly believe it because the other three of you wouldn't go about your daily lives and go to bed if there was somebody hiding in your house, right? So don't fall for that. If she truly believed it, you'd never get her to bed, right? I mean, she doesn't truly believe it. If you truly believed that there was someone hiding upstairs, she wouldn't go upstairs and go to sleep, which ultimately she does. I wouldn't fall for that. And I wouldn't even talk to her about that content anymore. I might say to her, look, I'm not playing this game with your worry anymore. You can tell me that you truly believe someone's upstairs. We know that's not true. Your worry has convinced you. And this is a game that we're playing. And I'm not playing this game anymore. So don't fall for that. She doesn't truly believe it or else she wouldn't go to sleep every night, which she does, I assume. She goes to sleep every night, right? She does. She will go to... Now she... It's got to the point where one of us, my husband or I, need to also be upstairs. We've refused to stay in her room, but we will go into our room, so on the bed reading a book, or my husband will work on his laptop until she's asleep, and then we'll go back downstairs. Okay, so she's worrying. I think it's really important for you to help her differentiate. She's worrying that there's somebody upstairs, but she doesn't truly believe it. Just don't play that game. That's a slippery slope to go down and then you're going to get, we don't want to argue about the content. One of the things you want to ask her is that you want to say, if somebody were afraid of dogs, because you're not, you're not afraid of dogs, what would they imagine? What would they think about to get them terrified of dogs? And ask her to go through the process of how somebody makes themselves terrified of dogs. How does somebody make themselves terrified of going up a chairlift? How does somebody make themselves terrified of going to school. And so have her begin to think about how you create that worry about content that doesn't really get her going. Here's what I think we should do. I think you should try this out for a period of time, and then we're going to have a part two. We're going to have you come back, and we're going to have you report on how things are going. So let me just lay this out for you so you know what to do. Okay, so first of all, consistency is the name of the game. And she is going to not like this in the moment. So even if you put this plan together during the light of day when the sun is in the sky, she may say like, oh, I don't know, but she might be willing to do it. And then come the actual moment, she's going to not think it's so great. So be prepared for that. You're going to have some inner strength here, right? Some outer vanilla ice cream and some inner strength. You're going to be calm and cool on the outside. And it's going to be a step process. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to explain this to her the way that I did, where this is her worry, showing her this movie, convincing her that this is what's going on. She has fired up her amygdala and her amygdala right now is just going to listen to what she and her worry tell it. So she's watching the movie. She and her worry are creating the movie. Her imagination is really powerful. And you are going to practice doing things on purpose that make the worry show up. And then she is going to say to worry something along the lines of, this is what my worry does, or hello, nice to see you, or this is no surprise, or excuse me, but I'm doing my brain retraining, or amygdala, don't fall for it. She might even say, I'm going to handle this. I'm not going to get sucked in. I'm not playing your game, whatever she can come up with. And then you play that game of putting something on the bathroom sink or putting something on her bed and have her practice that repeatedly. Set it up if you want to make a little game with a little prize on it. At night, when it's time to actually do it, when it's time to go to bed, this is when you're going to say, okay, so remember, we've been practicing retraining your brain, retraining your amygdala, and we're going to do the same thing now. And I suspect, I can predict that she's going to get really pissed off, that she is going to cry, she's going to whatever. And that's where you're going to have to hold the line, loving and supporting and encouraging. I know this is really hard. I love you so much. You've told me you don't want to have your worry be so in control of you. I don't want it to be in such control of me either. And so we're doing this together. I love you. And this is the way your worry works. 
And so now let's go over what we have to do. I would write down for her what her statements are that she's going to say, what the reminders are that she's going to say so that she can even have them in hand when she's going upstairs. Maybe you make a little copy and put it on her bedside table so it's there for her to see so that she's constantly able to pull up this information. The thing you don't want to do is any elimination language, which means worry, go away and never come back. We know worry is going to show up. We want to expect it to show up. And you have to really stay out of the accommodation and reassurance. So you can reassure her and say, look, I know this is hard, but this is how we're retraining your brain. But what you want to stay away from is there's nobody upstairs. I've told you there's nobody upstairs. I want you to say that initially as you're setting this up. I want you to say, look, here's the deal. I'm not playing this game anymore with your worry. I'm not going to get sucked in to believing your worry. I'm not playing. And together as a team, we're not playing. Our whole family, we're not playing. Worry is going to try and convince you we're not playing. And just be very methodical about it. But you got to get some buy-in from her. And you want to make sure that she practices it when she doesn't really need it. Now, what's the likelihood of her saying, absolutely not. This is ridiculous. I've never heard anything so stupid in my life. I'm not doing it. What's the likelihood of her saying that? Uh, She'll do it during the daylight hours. I think she'll find that quite fun and a challenge. And I think it'll be tough at nighttime. And she's very strong-willed. It'll be a challenge. Okay. And tell her that you appreciate how strong-willed that she is. And we're just going to use that quality, that characteristic to her benefit. So I want you to take some of that stubbornness, some of that will you have, and I want you to use it to not make worry wart so powerful instead of using it to keep worry going. And really just talk to her. This is how people keep worry going. And you're doing it the same as everybody else. See how she can respond to that. She is going to be pissed off. Even if she says, this is just amazing, I love this, this is so interesting, even if she says that, she's going to push back. Do you feel like you have enough information to kind of put this into place? Yeah. Okay. Propose this to her and you can email me back and let's give it a few weeks and then you can come back. If she'll talk to me too, that would be fine too. We can have her come on. If she wants to come on, that would be pretty awesome. It's going to be bumpy. So when she's at the bottom of the stairs or halfway up on the landing and crying and, you know, not wanting to go further, how do I get past that point? Yeah. So you're going to have to say, so we knew this was going to happen. And so then you would ask her, so how will we get past this point? I would say that to her ahead of time. I would say, this is what I predict is going to happen. What I predict is going to happen. We're going to do this. We're going to practice during the day. And then... You're going to get really upset about this. You're going to sit on the landing. You're going to cry. And here's what we're going to do and even write it out for her. You're going to be very, very boring and redundant. And that's what I struggle with because then all my emotions come to play and the reassurance comes out and then the frustration comes out. Yep. That's the way it works. And let me just predict this for you. You're not going to do this perfectly. And there are going to be times when your frustration and your reassurance comes out. And then after the fact, you can say, oh, we're working so hard on this. I didn't do my part either. (laughs) I got sucked into worry. That's totally fine. She knows you love her. She knows that you're supporting her. She knows that you care about her. And she also knows that she can outlast you. She can. Yeah. And people say to me all the time, oh, is it worry or is I'm being manipulated? Oh, no. Worry is incredibly manipulative because it wants what it wants. I've worried in the past and my husband hasn't, but I try to explain to him how it grabs hold of you and it is so illogical. Yeah. It's so illogical. It's so powerful as well. Yep. And so she knows you know that. And so you can say to her when she's really struggling, you can say, I know how illogical this feels. I know how powerful this feels, but I love you too much to let worry be the boss of you and our family. So you're going to have to ride some things out for sure and predict ahead of time that you're going to have to ride them out. Predict ahead of time. All right. So write things down, come up with a plan, play with it during the day. And then say, when we do it at night, this is what we can expect, but we're going to stick with it. We're going to do it together. Okay. And if she refuses to go upstairs? 
well, where would she sleep if she refuses to go upstairs? The goal is for her to be able to go upstairs. It doesn't mean that you'll never go upstairs. The goal is for her to go upstairs, get ready for bed. And then you come up a little while later and kiss her in and put her to bed. Just like you do with your son, right? You want bedtime to be similar. You've got an 11-year-old who goes upstairs. Think about how his bedtime goes. That's how you want that ultimately her bedtime to go. But if she sits on the landing and screams for an hour, you're like, all right, well, I'm ready to go. I'm going up to bed. Mm -hmm. So do your normal thing without you being so dictated by her. And it may be, you know, realistically, she's losing her mind. She's screaming. She's throwing a fit. And there may be a night where you say, you know what? I cannot deal with this. Let's go upstairs. And then the next day you do a little post-game analysis, but try to not have that happen if you can. But if it happens, it's not the end of the world. Okay. This, her going to sleep, needing somebody upstairs. Do we do all of that at the same time? No, let's work on this first part first, and then we'll get to the next part. Okay. Yeah. But with the vomiting thing, don't talk to her about the vomiting. Don't give her reassurance. Don't get sucked into that. Yeah. And you and your husband just pay attention to how much you find yourself accommodating this thing and see if you can cut back on the accommodations. But take it one step at a time. All right. We want to get her talking to her worry. We want her to to be engaged in this process. We want her interacting with her worry in a different way. That's the important first step. All right, so now we are back with Marie, and we have taken a two and a half month break. So if you listen to part one, I gave a lot of instructions for Marie, and they were going to work on the worry. So Marie said, all right, we're going to go to it. We're going to see what we can do. And now here we are back two and a half months later. This time, not only do we have Marie with us, but we are very lucky to have the star of the show herself. And so Lane is here joining mom. And so we are going to talk about what you've done, if you've had some successes, what you've learned about your worry, what's helped so that we can see, because what the listeners want to hear about is how do you go from being really kind of trapped by your worry to being able to manage your worry a little differently? Can you start by telling us sort of what you've noticed over the last few months and what's worked and what hasn't worked. And then we'll find that out from Lena as well. Yeah, sure. So after speaking to you, you gave me the advice to play the game about, because Lena at that time was really worried that somebody was upstairs in our house. So, and it was causing issues. She wouldn't go upstairs on her own for anything. So we played the game where to get her to go upstairs we got a bunch of wooden blocks and I hid them in, well, I didn't really hide them, did I? I just placed them in different rooms. So in the bathroom, in the bedrooms, and Lena was to go up and collect them. So I think the first time, did you collect them all at once? Yeah. Yeah. So she ran around and collected them all at once, like a little Easter bunny, and brought them downstairs again. And there was a little bit of resistance, but it was quite fun, wasn't it? He wanted to do it, so it was a bit of a game. Yes. And then, so that was good. She got, she did that fine. And then we did put the blocks in and she collected them one at a time. So each time it got a little bit trickier and the blocks got closer to like the attic where that was where her main concern was. And she did really well. And so that was over maybe a week or two weeks we did that. And did you enjoy doing that? Yeah. Yeah. And that's fine. Now she's going up and down the stairs on her own. Even if it's you come home late and it's dark, she'll go up and turn the lights on. And yeah, that worked. <laughs> that is pretty amazing. Lena, can you tell me in your words what it was like for you to do that? Like, how did mom convince you to do that? And then what do you think helped? What was the secret to your success? Um, Were you nervous at first? You were nervous at first. Yeah. Yeah. And how did mom convince you to do this crazy thing? Because she talks to this lady in America about going upstairs and you're convinced that there's somebody upstairs. Did it seem hard for you at first? Yeah. It did. And then did it get easier with time as you practice it more? Did it get easier? Yeah. It did. Mm Mm-hmm. And it was quite fun, wasn't it? It was a challenge, hey? And that's one of the really important things to remember about anxiety and worry, because they really want 
you to take it very seriously, Mm. right? Worry wants you to be scared. It doesn't want you to mess around. It wants to make you almost watch that scary movie in your brain and imagine all these things happening. And once we start being a little playful with it, once we start being a little silly with it, then it gets less powerful. So it sounds like that's what might have happened for you. And so after you played this game over a period of weeks, and Marie, jump in if you feel like you can fill in some of the gaps uh, for Lena. But what do you think changed in the way that she was thinking about worry? What did she do inside that allowed her to not let this thing be so bossy, do you think? Do you think you told the worry? Did you talk to your worry? Yeah, what did you say? Yeah, what did you say? No one's upstairs. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? But I wonder because prior to you playing this game, Mom had told you that about, what, 8,029,000 times, right? How many times had mom and dad said, Lena, no one's upstairs? How did you finally begin to believe that? What do you think? We know when upstairs and no one was there. Ha. Huh. So you had to practice it over and over again to prove to yourself and to prove to worry. It was quite exciting, wasn't it? And I could hear her little feet running so fast coming back, <laughs> coming back down the stairs. And then it got slower and slower and you got more confident, didn't you? Yeah. And so that's really confident. That's such an important word because a lot of times what happens when kids are afraid of something or worried about something, they won't give themselves a chance to even try it out, right? So mom had been saying and dad had been saying, oh my gosh, there's nobody upstairs. Why would we be upstairs? Why would we let somebody, we're upstairs too. Why would we let somebody be upstairs in our house? And you and your worry were determined you were not going to believe that, right? Nope, there's somebody, you are convinced there's somebody upstairs. And by playing this game, you got to take your worry upstairs and you and your worry got some proof that this was a game that worry was playing because worry plays a game too. And so we just played a different game with worry. So you were very courageous to practice that. You did a really good job. So that's really fabulous. I hope you feel very proud of yourself for being able to do that. What's also kind of interesting, Lena, is that a lot of parents will say to me, and sometimes kids too, of course, no, 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 that won't work. I'm not going to do what you say. I'm going to listen to worry. This is never going to change. I'm always going to feel this way. And so you are sitting here. I'm looking at you and I am seeing proof, visible proof that when you practice and when you step in, things can really change. So I'm delighted to hear that. Yeah. And you wanted to change too, didn't you? You wanted it to go away. Well, not go away, get smaller. (laughs) Well, to not be so bossy, right? That's the thing about worry. Do you remember how worry felt bossy to you? What was that like for you to not be able to go upstairs? Mm, You remember you almost physically couldn't go upstairs, could you? It was like you were stuck on the landing. (laughs) Yeah. You felt stuck like your feet were cemented to the floor. Yeah. And now do you feel free that you can run up and down? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what you traded in that feeling of being stuck for that feeling of being free. To go upstairs and get what you want. To go upstairs and do what you want, right? Without having worry be in charge of you. That's terrific. Are there any other ways? Because I know your mom talked to me about maybe some other places where worry showed up. She told me about places where worry didn't show up because I hear you're quite a skier and you'll just go up the ski lift and come down and worry doesn't get in the way of you skiing. Is there any other places where you feel like worry maybe is getting in the way, making you feel stuck? Mm, When I'm in bed. You're in bed. And does worry have something to say about what's going to happen at night? What is worry really telling you now? What does worry tell you when you're in bed? It's okay that you're going to be sick. Yeah, you worry that you're going to be sick. Yeah. Mm, Yep, that you're going to throw up. Yeah. Oh, and that's such a common worry because who wants to get sick, right? It's not a very pleasant thing to have happen. I don't like it. I've never met anybody who says, oh, yeah, it's great. (laughs) Hey, everybody. This is Robin at Fluster Clocks. When Lynn and I are not having a great time recording our podcast on the weekends, I have a day job. I have a travel magazine for families. So if you're thinking about a 2023 family vacation, don't plan anything without reading our guides to the best Disney hotels, the best way to get a Disney guide for less, and everything you need to know about booking a Disney cruise. 
Lux Recess has been since 2014 the go-to place for parents to read about luxury travel with honest reviews written for parents by parents. Check it out. The links are in the show notes for our best guides to Florida travel for your spring break in 2023. That's luxrecess.com. L-U-X-C-R-E-C-E-S-S dot com. Okay, we're back. So it's pretty normal to not really want that to happen, of course. But the thing that worry does, worry has you think about it all the time. Worry wants you to imagine it. Worry wants you to act almost as if it's happening right now, right? So it's sort of like if you hate rats and you're sitting and watching a movie about rats and there aren't any rats around, but your imagination is making you feel that way. It's making you think that way. Your little amygdala in your brain doesn't know the difference between it really happening and you just imagining it. So your little amygdala, which is like your little smoke detector, tells your body, (gasps) there's rats, but it's really just you imagining that it's going to happen. So you spend an awful lot of time thinking about what if I throw up tonight? And so you spend a lot of time kind of planning and preparing and feeling afraid. It would be like if every night I got into bed, because I hate rats, by the way, If every night I got into bed and I just imagined what it would be like if there was a rat under my bed and I thought about it and I imagined it and it got to the point where I even thought maybe I heard a rat under my bed. Was that a rat? Did I just hear a rat? And sometimes when kids are worrying about throwing up, they think, did my stomach just make a noise? Wait, I think I feel it. Is it happening? And it's that imagination that gets you. And that's what worry does. It takes something that is very unpleasant, like rats and throwing up. And it turns them into something that you feel like you're experiencing right now in the moment. And your imagination just makes it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, let me ask you a few perhaps difficult questions, but I bet you can handle them. Have you had the opportunity to practice actually throwing up lately? (laughs) She's nodding. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So Marie, do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, that was a couple of weeks ago. Oh, okay. I feel really guilty because Lena, maybe three or four nights out of seven, she will have a worry bug about throwing up. So this particular night, worry turned up again and said, I'm worried I'm going to be sick. And I was just, oh, but it's just your worry coming along, telling you you're going to be sick. Everything's fine. (laughs) A couple of times through the night. And then she actually was sick. She did have a gastro. So, Uh yeah, it was a bit of a boy who cried wolf situation. Yeah. And that's what can happen. Yeah. So what did you think about that, Lena? (laughs) You were not thrilled. (laughs) Okay. That is not an unusual thing to happen. Because if three or four nights a week, somebody is worrying about throwing up, it's hard to know the difference, isn't it, between when it's real or when it's worry. And at some times, it's going to be real because sometimes we get sick. I don't know anybody who's never thrown up. Everybody that I know has thrown up and it can happen for sure. Let me ask you another question. How did you handle it when it was actually happening? Mm. Did you throw up? Did you feel miserable? Well, you told me it was actually, thinking about it was worse than actually doing it, didn't you? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Thinking about it was actually worse than doing it. So when you actually got a stomach bug, did you call it a gastro? Is that what you said? Yeah. So Marie's in New Zealand, everybody, in the middle of winter. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So we usually call it a stomach bug. Yeah, we do too. Yeah, we call it a, yeah. But gastro, I like that. Maybe I'm going to use that from now on imagining it and thinking about it and worrying about it and anticipating it was actually worse than actually going through it. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's very curious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if you know that now, because you actually, you getting a stomach bug, you getting a gastro was almost the very same thing of you practicing running upstairs and getting those blocks out of the bedrooms upstairs. Just not nearly as much fun. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Not nearly as much fun. But you did it. So what do you think you learned about having a stomach bug, having a gastro? What did you learn? Mm, You can say it again. (laughs) What did you learn? That it's not as bad as you imagine it to be? Yeah. That you handled it? You handled it, yeah. You learned that it was unpleasant, right? You learned that it's not a very fun way to spend a few days. 
but you learned that you handled it. Now, if you are lying in bed at night, again, does worry show up again and start talking about being sick? Yeah. Yeah. And do you have a different response to it when worry shows up? Sometimes. Yeah. What might be the different response Mm. now that you've learned something? I can handle it. Yeah. You can handle it. It doesn't happen every night, of course. We don't get a stomach bug every night, but every once in a while we do. And when it shows up, here's what we know. It'll be unpleasant. It usually takes us by surprise. Nobody I know enjoys it, but everybody I know has it happen every once in a while. And you can handle Mm -hmm. it. And thinking about it and imagining it is much worse than when you were actually going through it. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty important information to have, isn't it? Yeah. So Marie, what have you noticed any difference since Lane has been sick? Have you noticed, has it been more frequent, her worry showing up? Has it been more powerful? Has it been less frequent, less powerful? What have you noticed? I think possibly less frequent, but it did appear again last night. Yeah, it did. Uh, I wondered if that was because she knew that we were doing this in the morning. I don't know. Maybe. Oh, perhaps. Yeah, because you were a little nervous about coming on and talking to me, right? Yeah. Okay, so walk me through you two. How does it show up? So Lena's in bed, she's tucked in. And then how do you know, Marie, that worry has shown up? Well, we talked about this last night. She goes a little bit like uncooked spaghetti. (laughs) She's quite (laughs) stiff and worried looking. And then she tells me, Mommy, I have a worry bug. Uh Uh-huh, okay. And um, yeah. (laughs) So you say, I have a worry bug. And then she says, I'm worried I'm going to be sick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what's mom's response to that, Lena? What does mom say back? Mm. What do I say? (laughs) You know what I say. (laughs) I say it all the time. That's your worry speaking to you. Mm -hmm. That's your worry speaking to you, right? Now, what does worry want mom to say? Because sometimes that answer is very unsatisfying to kids. What do you think your worry wants mom to say? You'll be okay. (laughs) yeah you'll be okay you're not gonna get sick right oh don't worry about it you'll be fine (laughs) oh yes I'll stay with you yeah yep here's some magic medicine to give you that'll make it all go away right of course because you want reassurance from mom but what mom's doing actually saying that's your worry she's reminding you of something isn't she she's reminding you that you have a really powerful imagination and that it likes to show up at night as you're lying in bed. It wants you to watch the movie called Lena Gets a Gastro, which is not a very pleasant movie to watch. Your worry wants you to pay a lot of attention to what's going on with your tummy and your body. That's what your worry wants. And so we want to get that little bit of distance from your worry, and you want it to say, I can handle it. To even say, oh, of course I'm going to have that thought. Right? When my worry shows up, that's what it says. It's so boring. And this is what it likes to do. And it's just me watching a movie. So I'm afraid of rats. And also, I don't really like bats, although I don't think about bats very often. I don't think about rats very often either. And the other night, I was getting ready for bed just a few nights ago. And my cat was sleeping on my bed, just sitting on my bed with me. And all of a sudden, the cat jumped off the bed and ran out of my bedroom. And I thought, oh, what's that about? And then all of a sudden, the bat that was he was chasing came back into my bedroom and started circling around in the ceiling. (laughs) So I dove onto the floor. I dove down onto the floor and I yelled, bat, bat, bat. Mm -hmm. We got the bat into the TV room. We opened all the windows. We shut the door and we said, bat, you can have peace and quiet for the night and please find your way out when you're ready. And in the morning, the bat was gone. Now, if I wanted my worry to grab a hold of me, what would I do the next night when I went to bed? What would I imagine? What would I think about? The bat. (laughs) The bat. Exactly right. I would revisit what happened the night before. I would listen for any noise. I would stare at my cat to see if my cat was chasing anything. I would be waiting for the bat to come back in. All my attention. I'd be waiting for it. Now, could a bat come back into my house sometime? Do you think that's possible? Yes. Yes. And this isn't the first time a bat has come in the house. I think in all the years I've lived here, I think we've had a bat in the house three times. So, you know, could happen again. But what worry wants me to do now is to focus very, very distinctly. It wants me to pay attention. It wants me to imagine. It wants me to get sucked into the story of the bat. 
so that I might even say to my husband, well, I can't sleep in this room anymore, or I'm going to build myself a great big box that I sleep in. So in case a bat comes in, the bat can't get me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I'm going to sleep with a hood over my head. I'm going to sleep with a broom just in case a bat comes in. I can whack the bat. I could come up with all sorts of things to do. Or I could lay in bed with my husband and every five minutes I could say, do you think that's a bat? Do you think that's a bat? Do you think that's a bat? And after a while he would say, oh my God, what is wrong with you? Yeah. If a bat comes into my house, I will handle it. I do not want a bat in my house. If you get another stomach bug, you can handle it. You do not want a bug to come into your house. You do not want a bug to come into your body, right? I don't either, but you can handle it. So what I want you to practice doing is that at night when you go to bed and that worry pops up, which it will, because if we talk to your worry right now, you would say, oh yeah, oh gosh, I love bugging Lena at night. It's just, it's one of my favorite things to do. I really enjoy it. When that worry pops up, you're going to say to your worry, you're going to say, oh, hi, worry. Yeah, I knew you were going to show up. And I'm not going to let you boss me around. And I am not going to watch the movie you want me to watch. Just like Lynn is not going to watch the movie called The Bat in the Bedroom, right? I'm not going to watch that movie. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it takes a little practice. But what worry really wants you to do is worry really wants you to pay attention. It wants you to be a rigid, uncooked piece of spaghetti. It wants you to think about it and imagine it. And you don't need to do that because what you found out a few weeks ago is that when you do get a stomach bug, It's unpleasant, but you can handle it. You don't need to spend all this time practicing, right? You don't need to practice having a stomach bug in your imagination. You know how to do it just fine. I don't need to practice getting rid of the bat in the bedroom because so far we've done a pretty good job of getting rid of them. (laughs) I don't need to practice. I'm not going to have bat drills. (laughs) Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you tell me the main thing that you're going to say to your worry bug when it shows up? Like that would happen. Yeah, like that would happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about, can you tell yourself you can handle it? And how do you know that? How do you know you can handle it? Have you handled it before? Yeah. Yeah. Just like now you can handle going upstairs. I would never say to anybody, okay, so mom, let's play again. (laughs) Let's give Lena a stomach bug so she can practice it. I wouldn't say that. But... Oh my gosh, it was so lucky you got a stomach bug. I mean, oh my gosh, what? it was your lucky day. I can tell your mom, put blocks upstairs and play a game with that. I can't tell her, oh yeah, let's give her a stomach bug. But oh my gosh, what a lucky day. You got a stomach bug. You were able to practice it. (laughs) What a lucky day. A bat came into my bedroom and I survived. Yeehaw, right? We just want to make it a little more playful, don't we? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, is there anything else you want to tell me about? Is there anything else that I need to know? No? Do you feel like you've got a plan for this when it shows up? Mom knows what to do. She's doing a great job with it. Every once in a while, she might be Mm -hmm. wrong. I still fall into the trap of reassuring because you want to make them feel better. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah, it is hard. But it sounds like you're doing a good job. It sounds like you're really doing a great job of making this less powerful so that you can go off and live your lives. Marie, is there anything else you want to fill us in on or anything else that you did, any other successes that you want to share? Well, after the playing with the blocks and Lena being okay with going upstairs, around that same time with her worry that somebody was upstairs, one of us, my husband or I had to, we didn't stay in her room until she fell asleep, but we stayed in our bedroom because that reassured her that nobody was up or, you know, she was safe and no one was upstairs so she could fall asleep. Mm -hmm. But in the last couple of weeks, we have stopped doing that, haven't we? (gasps) So now Lena. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. I said that dad and I need some time together downstairs. We're going to watch an episode of a show. Yeah. And then we come to bed. That's working really well. That's fantastic. That is great. All right. So you are offering a great example and great hope for a lot of people who think, oh, I can't do this. I'll never be able to do this. Because when we spoke the first time, it felt like that, didn't it? And you've done it. So that's amazing. I hope all three of you are just so proud of yourselves. 
So when you finish this recording, I want everybody to just give big high fives to each other and just feel really, really proud that you were able to follow this through. It was about consistency and it was about playfulness and it was about you trusting the process. Fantastic. All right, Lynn, is there anything else that you want to say before I go? Is there any words of wisdom that you want to offer the parents who are listening? Maybe something to help their kids. They can do it. Feeling a little shy. All right. Well, yeah, Lena usually speaks a lot more than this. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I'm so happy that you agreed to join us today, Lena, because I think many people are going to listen to this and say like, all right, well, it's possible. I guess it really can be done. So I so appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for listening. And if you found this podcast helpful, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find this information. And if you'd like to dig deeper on any of these topics, we have specialized playlists on our Spotify profile and the link is in the show notes. Topics like teens, depression, and OCD. Hey, are you a parent of a teenager? Are you feeling overwhelmed about how to be what they need while also holding limits and boundaries that keep them safe? Are you tired of conversations that negate how messy this season of parenting is? Well, I've got you. My name is Casey O'Rourke. I am a positive discipline trainer, parent coach, and the host of the Joyful Courage podcast. Every week I come to you with an interview, digging into tough topics with experts I trust and solo shows that go deep into the personal growth and mindset needed to raise teens in a way that grows them into confident, capable young people. I am not afraid of getting real about the intersection of conscious parenting and the teen years, while also bringing in vulnerability, humor, and lightness. I'm walking the path with you and honored to serve. Listen to Joyful Courage on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts.